Okay, can we start, please? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so in the previous lecture, we discussed uh, recurrent and transient states. the notion of forbidden subconfigurations uh, then we discussed the burning test multiplication with identity test showed, uh, oh, I forgot, what else did we discuss? Equivalence under toppling. Equivalence classes under toppling. And we discussed number of equivalent classes. equal to number of recurrent states. Recurrent configurations. Uh, did we discuss anything else? Okay, only this much. Any questions about this? So, yes, please. And yesterday you talked about that for the systems that they don't have symmetry. Yeah. Okay, well, burning test is failing. Sorry? A burning test is failing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Burning and test is failing. not applicable in cases where the matrix is not symmetrical. Uh, why? You have to go through. The, no, no, no. I can give a long answer, but I'll give a short one. So, you should go through the argument which we justified to explain burning. And it, it depended on identifying forbidden some configurations. And you said that if this thing works, then you know, there, there is a proof for saying this configuration is forbidden. And if it is forbidden, it will not burn. And that depends on the burning rule. And that uh, it just doesn't go through, as if you can check for the particular example I gave 2 by 2 pi, okay? So then the whole argument is not working. It goes through steps and one of the steps fails, then the whole argument fails. But then you can modify it and the new test which is called the multiplication test is still working. And so that is just a generalization of the burning test, okay? Okay, so there was a one um, sort of, uh, question which was asked, which was that this counting of the eigenvectors under the mm, uh, toppling rules or the counting of the vectors using phi was not fully clear. So let me do that once more. Oh, so, so, so what we say, is that there are a set of operators AI. AI operators commute with each other. And they satisfy these equations. AI to the power, let me write it like this. AI1, AI2, AI3, 
P I 4, where the rule is this is I, this is I 1, this is I 2, this is I 3, this is I 4, these are the four neighbors. So now I do not know too much about these objects A. A should be thought of as some abstract symbols and uh, they satisfy these rules. They are some kind of operators. So I can write A, A squared, A1, A1 squared, A1, A2, A1, A1 to the power 7, A2 to the power 15 and so on. And I can multiply two of such operators, A1 to the power 8, A2 to the power 3, A9 to the power 7, whatever. And the product is again one such thing. So I construct all such products and form a group uh, set which is equal to all products of A's. Okay? But these products, I can use these reduction rules to reduce the power so that no of the particular power occurs more than 3. So then the set of elements in here is finite and these closed under multiplication because if I multiply two of them, the power will become more but I reduce them till it becomes low and so this set is closed under multiplication. Okay? Then we say that, okay, so what is the smallest set of A's which I can use such that it is still closed. Okay? And so that number is lower than 4 to the power n and how, yes sir. How much lower it is, we don't know yet. Okay? So it is some size, but I don't know the size. I want to determine the size of that set. So can I use these product rules to determine the structure of A matrix, which I don't know in great detail just now. So in principle, A was some big matrix. Uh, I don't know it very well, but I want to determine, the, I want to diagonalize A. So what can I do it? So the answer is that we know that these A's are commuting with each other. They can be simultaneously diagonalized. So let me imagine, guess there is an eigenvector. Phi 1, phi 2, phi n, which is a simultaneous eigenvector of of all AI, okay? So then AI acting on this phi 1, phi 2, phi n gives me e to the power i phi i times the same vector. I don't know if there is only some one such vector, there may be 15 such vectors. I don't know what are the values of phi just now. But let us imagine that there is a vector like this and it has this eigenvalue. Why did I write the eigenvalue as e to the power i phi i? Because I know that the eigenvalues have to be modulus 1. Okay? So now what can I say about this? So I apply these reduction rules. And all the phi i's have to follow this equation still, right? So I have to have, so this implies that e to the power delta i j phi j summation over j equal to 1 for all i. Otherwise, these equations will not hold. Okay? And this then implies that delta i j phi j summation over j is equal to twice pi m i, where m i are some integers. Another way of looking at this problem is that suppose there is a simultaneous eigenvector phi then ai acting on phi just gives me a number times phi. So I will call it a number. 
A i. So, the last time I wrote A i acting on phi vector is equal to A i phi vector. So, these A i's are matrices, these A i's are just numbers, but applied on a particular vector, this matrix becomes a number and uh, this equation becomes an equation in numbers, complex numbers. So, the same equations which were first discussed as operator equations, I should think of as equations involving complex numbers. These are polynomial equations involving complex numbers. So, can I solve these equations together? Okay, and that is the solution. So, these equations thought each think of each a i as a complex number and I want to solve this equation. Then I write a i equal to e to the power phi i and phi i have to satisfy this equation. I take the log of the um, equation, it becomes a little bit easier to handle and the solution of this is phi j is equal to delta inverse i j m j phi i summation over j for some m i ok twice pi phi Okay. So, it gives you some information about what are these vectors, but I do not know everything about them. But then we said that at least we can count how many distinct eigenvectors you can form and there was some longish argument, but it said number of distinct uh, distinct e to the power i phi i set of numbers is determinant of delta because we just said that okay there is some all the solutions form some kind of vector in the space of phi and we looked at the vectors within a block minus pi to plus pi to the power d to the power n and this is the number and this is the answer. Okay. Then we went back to the original problem and we said, oh, we have a space of configurations. Then we make an equivalence class of all configurations and then uh, the operators A i take you from one configuration to another, but for each uh, equivalence class there is at least one recurrent configuration. Yes. Yeah. Delta is zero. Yes. Uh, and I had problem, uh, for example, in the first element, huh. in the first row, because yeah. of the boundary condition. Hmm. Uh, and for example, in. Yeah, no, that is clear. Uh, so, but I didn't assume anywhere that the sum of all the rows is one, zero. Sum over all the um, row elements for each row is zero only if the bond is not on the boundary, if the site is not on the boundary. So, there is no problem. It is what you say is correct, but we have never used the fact that the things add up to zero. Okay. Okay. So um, so far so good. Uh, now, I want to determine determinant of delta. That is what the first thing we want to do today. Okay. determinant of delta. Okay. So, I let us take the case where you have an L by M rectangle 
and I want to I write the corresponding delta matrix. It is L m by L m matrix. and I want to find the determinant. So, what we will do a little bit more, we will determine all the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix. Okay. So, the solution is done by inspection. So, delta i j psi j uh, m n is equal to lambda m n psi i m n. So, this is the eigenvalue equation where psi i m n is the eigenvector of the matrix and this is the eigenvalue. Okay. Formally, it looks like del squared psi equal to lambda psi. It is the same, it is just discrete version of this Laplacian equation and we are solving the discrete Laplacian. And the answer is that I just uh, remember Jackson's book and chapter 1. Uh, he actually does not discuss discrete equations, but psi of x, y, m, n. Uh, let us change notation. Eigen functions are psi m n x y. Is the notation clear? m n is some index, x y is the argument of the wave function, and this is equal to sine m pi x over l plus 1 sin n pi y over l plus 1. There is a root 2 by l root 2 by m and uh, corresponding lambda m n is equal to 4 minus 2 cosine m pi over l plus 1 minus 2 cosine n pi over m plus 1. Uh, bad notation, I think we will have to stick with it. Okay. Is this clear? By inspection you write down this vector and check that it works on the solution. Because I remembered that the solution of this equation on a square is sin m pi x sin n pi y and I try the same solution with, with now x and y are discrete numbers integers and it is still working. This wave function vanishes at x equal to 0 and y equal to 0 and it vanishes at x equal to l plus 1 and m plus 1 by construction and so it satisfies the boundary conditions and inside it satisfies the differential equation everything is working. And the number of distinct solutions is um, so m takes values 1 to l, n takes values 1 to m. So there are l m distinct eigenvectors, distinct solutions, everything is done. I even wrote down the normalization constant from memory. The point being that sine squared average is half and 2 by L takes care of the, 2 takes care of the half and root L takes care of the fact that you sum over everything you should get 1. Okay. So, now my lambda m n is known and the determinant of delta is equal to product over m equal to 1 to l, product over n equal to 1 to m, lambda m n. Which is equal to just writing in gory detail because it is Four minus 
is to cosine to uh, pi m by l plus 1 to cosine pi m over m plus 1. Same kinds of brackets. So, this is an explicit formula for determinant of delta. Okay? Yes, sir. These eigenfunctions are for the continuous problem. No, this is for the discrete problem. And, and they're the same or the continuous? They are the same. That, is the, that was the proof you have to check. I wrote them down by inspection based on some guesswork, but you go and check that it actually works. Okay? Because yes, sir. The determinant is an integer number. Yes. Actually, yeah, that is a good point. When I write this stuff like this, I involve cosine of pi by 13 and um, I don't know, cosine of pi by 17, depending on L and M. And it is not at all clear that when you multiply all these numbers, you will get an integer. Okay. So, it is a very interesting problem to see. You know, one thing is you can say that, yeah, 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 it will work out because mathematics is consistent. The, I didn't make any mistake. The other is to be able to see directly that this answer is actually an integer. So, how do I see that? I see that by writing e to the power i pi by l plus 1 equal to omega 1 e to the power i pi over m plus 1 equal to omega 2. Okay? Then, of course, this cosine is omega 1 to the power m plus omega 1 to the power minus m and that one is omega 1 to the omega 2 to the power some powers of omega are involved omega 1 and omega 2 when you multiply everything then uh, all kinds of powers so this will become some uh, product over mn sorry when i multiply out the product it will become something with some powers of omega to the power uh, m i omega to um, omega 1 to and omega 2 to the power m. But the only property I know about omega is that 1 plus omega plus omega squared plus is equal to minus 1. And if you use this property, all the um, terms in this product will cancel out and you will get only the integer parts left. That is a miracle. And it is good to be surprised at the miracle and you can sort of look at it further, which I will not do here. But so, the fact that this result is an integer is a result which follows from this thing called Galois theory where you write down the solutions of polynomial equations. After all, there was some polynomial equation which was the characteristic equation of the determinant I wrote down, which was an equation with integer coefficients. And then you sum up all the roots of that um, integer equation and the answers are nice symmetric functions of the coefficients of the equation and all of them were integers and this turned out to be integers. Okay? The sum of the roots is much simpler function than the roots themselves. So, cosine of m pi over l plus 1 is very bad function for general values of l. But summation over m equal to 1 to l of this is a very nice and simple function, which is just minus 1. Okay? So, we use this fact and the whole thing simplifies and you get an integer and that is uh, what we get. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you, um, for 
Trump has uh, half, two half the uh, first quota, mm -hmm. and then um, square the some uh, some of the terms mm -hmm. square. Uh, then uh, we uh, have uh, some product. Uh, the first terms are four, mm -hmm. uh, and the second terms are uh, on the first cosine, mm -hmm. and some on the uh, third cosine, and mm -hmm. uh, some uh, multiplication by, uh, of uh, these two mm -hmm. cosines. And then uh, another term is uh, mm, two cosine, uh, the theta, for example, mm -hmm. and two cosine uh, in beta, for example, mm -hmm. to the two. Yeah. And uh, this is, in fact, uh, uh, this multiplication is, in fact, the partition function of the Daimler model. Okay. Uh, when the Daimler model has uh, fluoroacetides, uh, all the fluoroacetides are mm -hmm. one, yeah. so it's uniform, and yeah. this is the number of the... Yeah, Daimler so let me uh, paraphrase your argument simply. It okay. says that in the Daimler model, the correlation pr product partition function actually has a very similar form like this. Yes. And there we know that the answer is an integer. And the same mechanism is working here, whatever it is. I don't think I fully followed your argument for the rest. No, 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 I actually did. But you know, I'm saying that even if I didn't follow your argument for the rest, the fact is that this kind of product form is very familiar in statistical mechanics. When you solve the partition function for the Daimler model, you get this result. When you solve the partition function for the Ising model, you also get some such form. It's a product over 1 minus cosine minus cosine, that kind of form. The partition function is this form, and the log of the partition function is the sum over such logs of such terms. So we are kind of comfortable. We are doing something which looks familiar like other models. And so it is nice to be able to see this much. And uh, in fact, that, uh, the, uh, the, that product of the square terms are, in fact, product of uh, some Chebyshev uh, polynomial. Yeah, very good. By uh, a, a complex variable. Yes. So, so in fact, there is a good deal of symmetric polynomials mathematics and Galois theory, which one can go off into to understand this partition function and the symmetries of this partition function and stuff like that. And I will not do that. You know, that's a very interesting direction. But that is sort of much more pure mathematics than I like to do. And I will not get in that direction. But it's an interesting field. It's a very interesting activity. So let me just mention. Uh, OK. So. So let's just say the result is an integer. OK. Now, uh, so what happens if L equal to 2, M equal to 2? Then determinant of delta is equal to, it. there are four terms. So it is uh, 4 minus 2 cosine, this is pi by 3, minus 2 cosine pi by 3, 4 minus 2 cosine 2 pi by 3, minus 2 cosine pi by 3 into 4 minus 2 cosine pi by 3 minus cosine 2 pi by 3 into 4 minus 2 cosine 2 pi by 3 minus 2 cosine 2 pi by 3, which I can evaluate because I remember cosine of pi by 3. So this is 2 into 4 into 4 into 6 which is equal to 192 last time I calculated. Okay, so that is the number of recurrent configurations for the 2 by 2 sen pi. The point I'm trying to make here is that one shouldn't be scared of these formulas. They look a bit scary, but you put in the numbers, they come out uh, nice and simple and you know, and for 2 by 2 I got 192, for 3 by 3, there is a bigger number. 
I do not fully remember. Okay? But we actually used Mathematica to figure out the answer for determinant of 10 by 10 and it comes out as a big uh, integer. And uh, then uh, what was imp interesting was to find the uh, uh, factors of this integer because this is an integer, but what we are concerned with sometimes are the subgroups of the um, this number and subgroups uh, the order will be the factor of this. So, for example, this was a prime number, then the answer would be very small, but it turns out sorry the answer will be that it has no subgroups, it has only trivial subgroups, but uh, it turns out that typically these integers um, this product can be broken into sub parts where each part is an integer. And so, the whole thing usually has it is a let us say it is a 20 digit integer and it will have 15 factors or yeah something like that large number of factors. You do not expect some 20 digit integer to break up into 20 factors. So, how come there are so many factors? Answer is there is a lot of symmetry in the problem which we have not explicitly discovered yet and it will be nice to figure that out. Okay. Uh, right now we will not do it, but let us um, go on. So, what do, um, so we have determined determinant of delta, what is it good for? Oh, well, I can write g is equal to delta inverse. So, that is written as summation over m n psi m n 1 by lambda m n psi m n. Yes, sir. No, 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 that is certainly true, but I am saying if I do not know even that result, I only see this product. Somebody has given me this formula that there is a product like this. Is this an integer? This is the question I am asked then how do I answer? I just have to use the properties of this product and so I would say that yeah, 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 it is a, I use this Galois symmetry or something, something and then I will be able to infer that this is an integer even though I will not calculate it fully. Okay. No, it does not imply, but it suggests okay. and I am saying that it is interesting to look at the consequences of this observation, okay. it does not imply. Okay. Very good. So, this I can write down, I will not write down the full formula, but let me write it in some detail g x y x prime y prime is equal to summation m n. 1 mm, root 2 by L root 2 by M root 2 by L root 2 by M sin pi M x over L plus sorry sin M x over L plus 1 sin pi M x prime over L plus 1 sin pi n y over L m plus 1 sin pi n y prime over m plus 1. So, that is an explicit formula for g of course, it involves some signs and some products and I you know if I am very smart I can in do this simplify this formula, but for the moment let me not bother. Okay. However, in the problem we asked last time what was involved was summation of g x y x prime y prime over x y x prime y prime. 
So, in this formula that is easy to do because you know I just have to sum this one and this one and this one and this one separately and they are easy to do and so this can be written simply is just summation m n I guess it says odd even terms will vanish odd terms will not vanish and then it will be some simple looking formula. Oh, uh, one by one important part was missed into 1 upon 4 minus 2 cosine pi m by L plus 1 minus 2 cosine pi n by m plus 1. Okay. So, sometimes the formulas are a little bit trickier, but they are not so hard and you, you should do not have to be scared of them. That is the message. Okay. I mean, yeah, they look worse. But they are, um, so let me make a comment, Professor Ruhani is not here, but he said that you know the sand pile corresponds to C equal to minus 2 conformal field theory and the f minus 2 field theory was very um, bad theory because it had negative norm and all kinds of bad things were happening. But I am saying that we are studying all these problems and we have not encountered anything awful, everything was very concrete and clearly explicitly done. So, whatever formal difficulties there are with the CFT approach are pro problems of that approach and not problems of the problem per se. The sand pile problem is very clear and well defined. The CFT theory for the sand piles is very useful, but it is a complicated theory it involves some mental gymnastics which I am not willing to do just now. Okay? So, it is useful to realize you know where is the problem? Why is the c equal to minus 2? I do not know I do not even know what is c. So far we have not defined c. No, no, no I think please I am pinpointing the difficulties. The difficulty is you know when you have a field theory description you work with continuum fields. The continuum fields are difficult to define, the discrete fields are much easier. They have all kinds of singularities, infrared um, divergences, ultraviolet divergences. We have managed to stay away from all those problems and that is why we are doing well so far. Okay? All right. Okay, so now we have done Ah, I have to write one more equation. So, usually people like to study L m large and then log of delta is equal to summation over m n log of 4 minus 2 cosine m pi over L plus 1 minus 2 cosine n pi over M plus 1. Okay. Because it, the answer was the product and I have just taken the log, it becomes a sum. That is all I did. But now, I can take the large L m limit and this goes to L square L times m into integral d theta d phi 2 pi 2 pi log 4 minus 2 cosine theta minus 2 cosine phi. Okay? So, so the number of recurrent states increases as exponential of the size of the lattice and this is the coefficient of the proportionality. This integral is less than log 4. Okay? It is actually like 3.2 if you work this out. Mm, the number is called, um, oh, it is you know, okay, it is just, it is a number and it is around 3.2. So, the number of recurrent states goes like exponential 3.2 to the power L m. 
which is much less than 4 to the power L m, which was the total number of possible states. The number of recurrent states is exponentially smaller than the number of all possible stable states to begin with, okay? but still grows exponentially. Okay. Ha, so, so firstly, this thing becomes summation over L, but now if L is large, I am doing log some, so I call this theta. So, this summation is over some discrete values of theta, which change very little for each term. So, I can replace that summation by an integral over d theta. And the summation over m can be replaced by an integral over d phi. Okay. So, so this is uh, th this number is three po uh, log of three point two. So this becomes three point two to the power l m. Okay, and it is nice to notice that this number is much smaller than the size of the re um, stable configurations with positive heights. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the number of recurrent states goes like this. That is correct. This is the log of the determinant. Ah, log of the determinant. Yeah, sure. Okay. Very good. What else? So it turns out that this function, like this form, is very familiar in equilibrium stat mac. Like as I said, the Ising model partition function looks like this. Nahid told us that the dimer partition function looks like this and uh, there is something called the spherical model where the partition function also looks like this and so on. So it is good to explore these a little bit. Uh, okay. Uh, so. So one place where the determinant delta appears okay so this part we have done Determinant of delta is equal to number of spanning trees. So there is a very famous theorem called the matrix tree theorem. Okay. And I guess it is kind of attributed to Kirchhoff. So it is very classical theorem and uh, that is uh, useful. So first I should define what is a spanning tree. So suppose you have a graph. Uh, let us take some general graph. some difficulty, confusion, can you help us? No, 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 if there is a real problem, you ask then, there might be other students who are having the same question. If there is no problem, I am happy to answer. There must have been, you were having very agitated discussion. <laughs> Go ahead, there is no question, it was a private discussion. <laughs> All right. Okay. So suppose I have a graph like this. Okay. So there is an object called the spanning tree, which is a uh, it's a set of edges on. I draw a tree graph on this. So now I will draw the spanning tree. Uh, 
so the red edges if you can see form a spanning tree of the graph what is it doing it is a tree it goes through the you know it's a graph on the it's a tree on the it is a set of edges which are occupied other edges are left empty the set of edges have the property that they go through all the vertices the tree goes through all the vertices and there are no loops so that is called a spanning tree now given a spanning tree i guess there is more than one way i can draw a spanning tree because i could have connected this node here by this edge and not by this one and so on there are many spanning trees so how many spanning trees there are that is a good question and people have tried to worry about it and the answer is the following let us first give the answer the matrix tree theorem is and that define the adjacency matrix adjacency matrix of the graph which is uh, for our case it will be called still let us me use call it delta so delta will be the diagonal entries will be the coordination number and the off diagonal entries will be minus 1 when there is a link and there will be zero otherwise i didn't write down the whole thing you know it will take me three lines to write but i just spoke it out the adjacency matrix is whose diagonal entries for each side it is the coordination number it can be different at different places the off diagonal entries are minus 1 if the sides are connected by an edge and it is zero otherwise so i write down the matrix this matrix has zero determinant because as was pointed out sometimes if all the row sums are zero because the diagonal entries are degree and minus 1 minus 1 how many is equal to the degree then row sums of this matrix are all zero so its determinant is zero that is not going to work so i so what i do is number of trees is equal to determinant of delta prime delta prime is obtained from delta by removing one row and column just take any row and column remove it and calculate the determinant of the rest now it is no longer zero and now it is the same whichever row and column you delete okay no it is not obvious but it is a, it's a statement you follow the statement the proof of the statement you will have to read up i am trying to point out that this is kirchhoff's theorem so you know it is very old 1850 like that and one should be familiar with it at some level uh, a little i don't know mass i just have a graph with some edges no so i'm let us go back and let's just look at this problem as stated there is a graph there is and that's all i know i don't know any sign i don't know any mass on the graph i want to count how many spanning trees there are that's the question okay forget the you know of course it's related to the sand pile problem but we were forget about the sand pile in the beginning we only look at the graph and counting the spanning trees on the graph so let me just give some cultural background so there is a notion by erdes who said that there is you know there are all kinds of theorems in mathematics and there are all kinds of proofs and a given theorem can have a large number of proofs but some proofs are very beautiful and very nice and other proofs are not so good so then he said there there is one book by god where the nicest proofs are written in the book all the other proofs are missing so you know he if you give him a theorem and you know give a proof he will say is the proof nice and or not nice is it sort of good enough to be in the god's book or not in the god's book okay that was some criterion for judging the beauty of proofs in mathematics 
And uh, so he used to do this, but later on, some set of people whose names I have forgotten actually decided, just uh, let me finish my story, then I'll get back to you. <laughs> no, I think it's a useful story for you to know. So some people decided to collect those nice proofs in mathematics. So they, with, they consulted a lot of other mathematicians. In the end, they converged to some book of 20 proofs, which are very nicest proofs in mathematics, whole of mathematics. And they collected them in a book, uh, which said that the first 20 proofs in the God's book. You know, God didn't intervene. It was selected by people. But uh, they selected 20 greatest proofs. That was, uh, you know, it was very appreciated. People liked the book. Then there was a sequel in which they added some 20 more proofs in the mathematics, which are really beautiful. And one of the extra, in the second edition of the book, or the second supplement, volume two, sequel of the book, one of the book proofs was matrix string theorem. It has a lot of generalizations to graphs which are directed, undirected, multi-directed, and all kinds of stuff. But you know, one of the proofs um, was by on the matrix tree theorem, one of the 20 greatest proofs in mathematics. So, <laughs> so I'm saying that you should read up the original proof somehow. It is very nice, and maybe you will appreciate the beauty of the proof. And if I present it here, maybe I will garble it up very badly. So I won't do it. OK? And now you, I can take your question. Yes? Uh, what is the relationship between delta and delta prime? Delta prime was obtained from delta by removing one row and column. And what was the feature of that row and column? Any. Can... Any you pick. It gives you the same answer. You meet every row? No, any one row and one column. The remaining matrix is of size n minus 1 cross n minus 1. It gives the number of trees in it. It's the same, whichever matrix you pick, whichever row and column you pick. The last result is the same for everything. That's right. OK, so it's a remarkable theorem. How did Kirchhoff come across it? The reason I'm stressing on all this is because Kirchhoff's laws are familiar to everybody. Originally, Kirchhoff was studying electrical networks. And so we are discussing, uh, let me write, uh, relation to the resistor problem. To the resistor network problem. OK? So what is the resistor network problem? Uh, there is a set of resistors. OK? I'm given all the resistances, R1, R2, R3. R4, R5, R6, R7. Okay? Then I apply some voltage across two nodes and I want to calculate how much current will flow in this network. That is the problem. Okay? This problem is familiar to everybody? Okay? So Kirchhoff gave a solution to this problem. He said that you should say that there is a current going in each node. And the uh, Kirchhoff's laws tell you that, you know, the divergence of the current has to be zero and the current is related to the voltage difference and so on and so forth. And you get a set of linear equations and you solve them and that gives you the current. And typically that is where the textbooks stop about Kirchhoff's laws. But Kirchhoff actually went further. He actually told you how much will be the effective resistance between two nodes A and B. Okay. So I want to write down that answer and that you should be able to appreciate. Uh, so he said that it is better to work with condu uh, conductances than resistances. 
So, I will work with sigma i equal to 1 upon r i. Okay? So, each node is specified by its conductance and I do not want so much trouble, I am sort of lazy just now. So, these will be called sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 4. These are the conductances of the parts and I pick any two nodes A and B and I want to calculate sigma A B which is the effective conductance between A and B which is the ratio of current to voltage. Okay? So, the formula he wrote was this one. Spanning trees on graph. Ah, I should write a little bit better. W T T divided by T prime. W T prime. Now it has become very obscure. So he said they take the network, drop all possible spanning trees on the network. So, one spanning tree looks like this. Okay? This one has a weight sigma 1, sigma 4, sigma 3. So, write down a term sigma 1, sigma 4, sigma 3. Then there is another way I can connect them which is like this. So, this one is called sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 and there are two more terms, one corresponding to erasing this one, one corresponding to erasing that one. Now, you do the same thing, but you put these two A and B, you collapse them together, just short them. You get a new graph, okay? it may have multiple edges. But if it has multiple edges and you want to go from here to here, you pick only one of them okay? and draw all possible sums over this graph. So, now these are collapsed. So, I will get sigma 1, sigma 3 plus sigma 2, sigma 3, uh, I guess that is for this one and then you can do others. Okay. So, the final result is a ratio, is a rational function of the sigmas. Okay. This result looks rather obscure to me just now. So, let us check. I remember this graph. Okay. So, this is sigma 1, this is sigma 2, this is A, this is B, sigma AB is equal to sigma 1, sigma 2 over sigma 1 plus sigma 2. That should be familiar. Okay? It is called the series combination of resistances. Looks a little bit less familiar because of the sigmas, but you know that is the way it is written. Uh, I can also do it for this one. Sigma A B is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 2. Because when you collapse them, then you cannot draw any edges because they are already collapsed. So, you have to write 1 in the denominator. Okay? Now, the general proof I am not going to give, but I have given the statement of the theorem. It is like this. The key point which is important for us is that what you got to do to solve the resistor problem is to study spanning trees on the network. To each tree you give a weight corresponding to the product of edge weights and sum over all of them and that gives you the partition function. Some stuff which you have to sum over all possible configurations we call that the partition function of the trees or some such thing and study those properties. So, they have been studied for a long time in the trivial problem of this one, but a more interesting problem is this one. Suppose you have a set of resistors like this on a square lattice, each resistor is 1 ohm. Ok? 
okay. And then I just take two nodes which are adjacent, put some plus 1 volt on one and minus 1 volt on the other. How much current will flow through this network? That is the question. That is a home assignment problem number 5. Okay. You have to calculate the effective resistance or effective conductance between two adjacent nodes on the square lattice infinite square lattice with all resistances equal to 1 ohm. It is a problem you should could have done in your BSc. You did not do it then, so you should do it now. It is very instructive and useful and you know it will help you in your future life sometime or the other. So, one should do it. It is not immediately related to my course actually. It is related but not fully related. Also. Okay. All right. So we have done Kirchhoff's theorem, but the connection to my problem is not yet clear. Except through this indirect way that the same determinant of delta was showing up. Uh, okay, I should uh, make one point. So how do we connect it firstly to my problem? So I I had this graph. and I form the delta matrix for my um, send pi. What you have to do is you have to imagine that there is a sink site, there is a boundary which is called sink and you connect uh, the stuff to sink sites like that. Now, you consider the, so the sink is only one, they are all shorted. So, there is only one side on the outside which is the sink side. Now, you write the augmented big matrix and calculate the spanning trees on this bigger graph. Okay. But then, when I have the choice of removing one row and column, I will remove the sink. Then I will get back my old delta and the determinant of delta will be the number of spanning trees on this bigger graph with sink side added. Okay. So, a trivial case one by one lattice, I had this, I had four recurrent states, but if I make the sink site, then there is a, you know the sink site is this one, this th whole thing is one site and there are four spanning trees, you can connect like this, like that, like that and so the number is 4, everything is working, check, a small check you know, it is good to make these elementary checks. Okay. Uh, now, we want to do something else which is uh, called, okay. so the, it turns out that the spanning tree problem is also known to be related to another problem which is well established standard problem in statistical mechanic which is called the POTS model. So, I want to relate this problem to the Q state POTS model in the limit Q goes to 0, whatever. Just one minute, yeah. The matrix tree theorem and resistor networks. Okay, and now we want to do something called number 4. which is connection of the tree, spanning tree problem Q states parts model. <coughs> in the limit okay so this is sort of mouthful of words but anyway we are going to define what is a q state parts model 
and then we will take the q goes to 0 limit and then show that it is the same as the spanning trees problem and by inference it is the same as the sand pile problem that we are studying. Okay. So, we define, we start a graph, we define a graph like that, some general graph. Okay. So, the vertices are called i, j and uh, if there is a link between the vertices, that will be called uh, v i j, it has a strength, there is a real number v i j attached to each link i j. Okay. Now, what I imagine is that there is a spin at each side okay. and it is coupled to other spins by these links. Question? Okay. So, I will write a Hamiltonian for this. So, the spin takes values 1, 2, up to q. There are discrete states 1 to q and the spin takes these q distinct values and the Hamiltonian of the system is for the moment we will write it like this minus j summation delta sigma i sigma j minus j i j. So, between any two links there is a, this delta function is 1, if it is sigma i equal to sigma j it is 0 otherwise. So, if the two spins have the same state, then there is an energy minus j, uh, minus j i j that is the contribution to energy, otherwise it is 0. Okay? You can take all j i j equal to j, let me do that for the moment. For the moment we will set all j i j equal to j. And later on we will say, oh, but if the bonds are different, then everything goes through and we will work with like that. For simplicity of notation, I am setting all j i j equal if there is a bond. If there is no bond, then it is 0. Okay, so, we will put this away, put this outside and this becomes a sum over edges, which are the non-trivial edges of the graph. Okay. So, now I want to write, you know, this is very standard partition function is equal to e to the power minus beta h sum over configurations of spins. And uh, so, if you have n sites, there are q to the power n distinct states and we sum over all of them. And so, this partition function can be written as summation over configurations product over edges 1 plus v delta sigma i sigma j, where v is equal to e to the power beta j minus 1. Okay. So, what happens? First, I sum over configurations, but for each configuration there is a weight. What is the weight? If the bonds are distinct, if the sides at the two ends of the bonds are distinct, the weight is 1. If the sides at the end of the bond are in the same state, the weight is a little bit more. It is 1 plus v instead of 1. So, I write it like this. This delta function is 0, then it is 1, otherwise it is this. v is equal to e to the power beta j minus 1. For the, us, v is a positive number just now. Okay. So, now what I can do is that I can expand this pro product 
and I have a graphical representation of the sum. So, I will write that a particular term may be present or not present depending on if delta is kept or not kept. So, a graph may look like this, you know this was my original graph, but uh, okay. So, the first term I have is that I do not keep anything. So, it will be 1 plus then there will be one edge kept like this and nothing else is kept plus a graph like this plus for each is this point clear this is very standard but I am trying to ensure that you people know this one. So, in the graphical expansion you just expand this out and each term is represented by a graph where an edge may be present or not present and you sum over all possible such graphs and the graphs are how many such graphs are there? Total number of such distinct graphs. Two to the, two to the power number of edges, right? Is that clear to everybody? The number of graphs is two to the power number of edges. I take this graph then there will be eight poss 16 possible graphs depending on each edge is kept or not kept. Okay. So, I look at any one of these terms, any one of these 2 to the power n terms. So, that looks like this. The set of edges together will form disjoint clusters. Yes. Oh, okay. So, this e to the power beta h is equal to uh, product over edges e to the power beta j sigma i delta sigma i sigma j. Because the Hamiltonian was a sum over terms, I can write it as a product over e to the power um, beta j i j, this product over i j. Okay? And then this thing can be written as is equal to product over i j 1 plus v delta sigma i sigma j, because either sigma j is 0 or 1 and then I adjust this value of v such so that it gives the correct answer for both choices. Okay? That's right. About graphs. Yeah. Okay, what about graph? Uh, I can't understand how we get graphs, how we can understand graph from the Okay, very good. Uh, so, what I am doing is I am expanding this product. So, it is a product over edges. How many terms are there? If the number of edges is E, then there are E terms. So, I expand this out, each is two terms there will be 2 to the power e different terms in the expansion. That is what I am saying that you look at one of those terms that will involve either keeping this term or this term. So, it is 1 plus v 1 2 delta let me write it like this 1 plus v 1 3 delta 1 3 1 plus v 5 7 delta 5 5, 7, 4, 7 and so on. So, I keep uh, this term here and uh, this term here and this term here. I make a choice either I keep this one or this one. Okay? So, that will be represented by an edge present or not present. If an edge is present, I am keeping this term. If an edge is not present, I am keeping that term. That is the rule. Then, the weight of a graph with the given edges is just the product of weight of each edge, which we will call v i j times delta function. Okay? All right. So, now I have this graph, I have the sum over 2 to the power e terms, but now I can do the summation of, oh, yes, so there is a summation over configurations of spins. That summation is now easy to do. Why? Because within a cluster, 
It says that spin here should be equal to spin here, equal to spin here. So there is only one choice for each, but total Q choices for the whatever value it has. So the summation over spins is equal to summation over, so this is equal to summation over tree graphs, no, edge graphs. Q to the power number of clusters, product V I J over edges. So that is the, that is the sort of basic expansion. When I expand this out and sum over spin states, the number of states allowed with these delta functions will be Q to the power number of clusters because each cluster can be in a distinct Q possible states. And if there are two sides which are, one side is not coupled to anything, that is called a cluster of size one. Okay. So very good, we have got this far and the weight attached to this is the edges which is cute. Okay, so very good. Now I have, so this thing is a z of q v. It's a polynomial in q and v. The partition function of the Potts model is a polynomial in q and v for any given graph. Okay, but now comes this great insight of Castellin, not Potts. Castellin said that, oh, once I have this partition function, it's a polynomial in Q. Then it can be defined for arbitrary values of Q where Q need not be an integer. So you can define a Potts model for Q equal to 0.5. And it is a well-defined model because this partition function is a polynomial in Q, put Q equal to 0.5, it gives a nice value, there is no problem. Okay, so Potts model can be defined for arbitrary values of arbitrary real positive values of Q. I guess you could extend it to negative values of Q or complex values of Q. Let us not do it. Yes. Uh, the starting point was that the Potts model for Q state integer. integer. Yeah, positive yeah. integer. Now we have extended the definition to all. So we will. Forget all the derivation. We will start with this definition. The partition function is defined by this formula. So we are not talking about any physical reality. Yes. Yeah, um, uh, okay. It's just the mathematical. No, no, no. So what you can say is that suppose you have a system, you can construct different clusters on it by occupying bonds at random. To each cluster, you attach a weight, which is a Boltzmann weight of the cluster. And then these are partition function over those uh, different possible clusters. So it's a partition function of clusters of various types. Okay. Okay. I don't want to think of it as Q distinct states of spins, which was the starting point. But anyway, the key point about this is that, of course, when you put Q equal to 2, this partition function reduces to the Ising model. When you put Q equal to 1, Yeah, percolation. Q equal to 1. I think that is very strange. If there is only one state, what is there to sum over? Nothing to do. No. No? Because the, the weights of all configurations are the same. Okay. So, but all the states, they, they, every spin is only in one state, then there is no sum to do. I am very comfortable. If there is one state per site, then what is the partition function? There is no partition function, it's just one state per side. That whole system has only one state. So the question is that in what sense is Q equal to 1 the percolation problem? Because the Q equal to 1 seems to be a trivial problem, while the percolation problem is perhaps a non-trivial problem. So what's the connection? Ha, ah, very good. So that is the point. The point is Q tending to 1 is not as trivial a problem as Q equal to 1. 
and so we look at the q tending to 1 and then the, that gives the percolation problem. Q equal to 1 by definition is sort of trivial, we do not want to discuss, but q tending to 1 may not be so trivial. Okay, very good. Ah, so, we want to do q tending to 0. So, now we have defined Potts model for general q. So, what happens in the Potts model is that you get graphs um, which may have, so this z q v is a partition function. It starts with a term which is 1, which is nothing. But then, oh, q to the power n. Okay. Sorry, maybe I start with 1. I expand the partition function in powers of q. So, there is a q to the power 0 plus q to the power 1 plus q to the power 2. No, there is no q to the power 0. There is only a q to the power 1. The minimum number of clusters can be 1. So, you sum over all configurations with only one cluster, then sum over all clusters with two clusters, so on. So, that is these terms. I look at the coefficient of q to the power 1. That is called z1. And it is only a function of v now. And q squared z2, which will be a polynomial in v still, a complicated polynomial in v and so on. But they will also have a 1. Mm. If they take no, so that is part of my definition. There is, a, there is at least one cluster in the whole system. So, it is q to the power number of clusters. So, the first term is q to the power 1. Next term is q to the power 2. And the maximum term is q to the power n. No, because I, that was the last term, because it was n clusters. When there is a only isolated vertices with no bonds, the weight is q to the power n and power of v is 0. But for me, I am expanding in powers of q, so it is the last term. It is there, but it is the last term, not the first term. Okay? Now comes an interesting idea that you take this z q v and um, usually we can do the following, we can take log z q v divided by volume of system limit volume goes to infinity and that gives me uh, minus f q v. So, you can work it out or you can show that if you take this kind of a problem, work with systems of bigger and bigger sizes, then the partition function as defined will grow exponentially with the volume of the system. It is a very general thermodynamic proof of this result which is given in Ruel, but we are not going there. I am just sort of giving a plausibility argument that this z will increase and this v is the edge ratio, no? so let us call it small v. And this partition function for something which has n nodes will grow exponentially with n for well behaved systems. Like I take a lattice model like this and n is the number of nodes in the system, then I make a bigger lattice, bigger lattice calculate z for each of them then the log z will increase linearly with n. Okay, we check that you know it, one of the terms was q to the power n, so it perhaps increases like that. Okay. So, this is equal, so we define this f q v. f q v now is a function of q and v. And now I want to study the case where q goes to 0 because q can be continuously varied, I can uh, make it very small, I can make it 0 0.0001 and look at what is the partition function at this value. Okay? So, what happens to the partition function when I put q very small? 
So there was this term and there was this term, but the second term will contribute much less than the first term. So when q goes to 0, the only terms which contribute to the partition functions are the terms where there is only one cluster. So everything should be connected. Okay. And then, but it may have, you know, it may, it may have this kind of structure. So it, it has different powers of v in it. But since everything is connected, everything, in the, there should be at least v n minus 1 edges there. So it will be v to the power n minus 1 plus v to the power n plus v to the power n plus 1, all that kind of mess. And uh, so I do not want to look it at even that. And so we will take, we will state now an uh, obvious result limit as q tends to 0, v tends to 0, z n q v divided by v is equal to partition function of spanning trees on the lattice. Uh, so, this has been nice, but let us, uh, sorry, this is the, okay. So, I divide by V because I am letting, sorry, I divide by Q because I am letting Q tend to 0 and this partition function itself will go to 0 as q goes to 0, but the lowest term is order q. So, when I divide by q, only the term where there is everything forms one cluster will survive and then I let v go to 0, then the lowest term will be v to the power n minus 1 t n. v to the power n minus 1 gives you that there should be at least n minus 1 links but if there are more links, then it has small weight because v goes to 0. And Tn is the number of spanning trees on the graph. Tn is an integer. So, so if I want to calculate Tn, that was my quantity of interest because that was equal to my re number of recurrent configurations. I should calculate partition function for Potts model for q, let q go to 0 and take some limit and that is the answer. But, sorry, I still don't understand why the 1 is not there, the partition function. Uh, aha, bec the one, uh, no, 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 so let us go back. Uh, Z q v is equal to summation over clusters, q to the power number of clusters v to the power, it's actually, it's, yeah, number of edges, okay. Uh, sometimes it is written like this, it is a nice notation, number of clusters, summation over configurations, q to the power c, v to the power e and summation is over E. Okay, what is that? E is a set of edges which are occupied and there are different possible choices of the subset of a occupied edges. There are 2 to the power number of total number of edges choices. So, the summation is over all possible sets E okay, for the graph. V to the power E is the product of the weights of all the edges. So, if the edge weights are different v1, v2, v5, you just multiply those edge weights. And c, num, mod c is the number of clusters, it's just a notation, it's the size of some set and c is the set of clusters and the size of the set is number of clusters and q to the power number of clusters, v to the power e, where e is a set and v to the power e by our notation means the product of the weights of all the edges in the set 
and then you sum over all the edges. Okay. Now, you are saying that there should be a term like 1, but know that lowest power of q is 1 in this, not 0. So, the term starts with q to the power 1. If you expand in powers of v, you can have a term which is v to the power 0, empty set. But empty set here corresponds to q to the power n. It is not 1, it is q to the power n. It is n distinct clusters. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so the weight is q to the power. Uh, huh? That is my definition. It is the number of clusters. The number of clusters is n then. If there are no edges present, then there are, each side is a different cluster. The number of clusters is n. And the weight is q to the power n. Okay. Yes, sir. Sorry, but why do we take the limit for v and it goes to 0? Uh, okay, why do we take the limit? Because I was interested in the spanning trees problem. I did not want to work with graphs like this where there are no loops also present. So, in order to get rid of the loops present, I get v tending to 0 limit. Then the loops drop out. But still that 2 to the power n term does not depend on q or uh, on uh, v is a constant. Yeah. And th does it create problems when I take the No, because q to the power n is actually very high order in q and I do not worry about it. But it is not on Q to the power n depends on Q, of two, course. Two is is a Q or a 2? Q. Q to the power n. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, 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 okay. When I let Q uh, tend to 0, the yeah, the, the, the edges are the number of terms is 2 to the power n. Okay. But the term without V is Q to the power n, not 1. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. Hmm. Uh, makes the loops, uh, okay, so very good. Let us look at this problem, just this reduced problem here. So, I take a graph like this, you know, I do not like to study very big problem. This is just a graph with four edges. What is the partition function for this graph? So, I can check that there are 16 terms in this, okay. So, this will be uh, z of this. So, there is one term like this where nothing is present. That is called q to the power 4 plus. Then there is a term where there is one edge present like that, some edge like this. So, let us write it first in graphs, then we will write it in weights. There is some term like this plus, some term like this plus 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 okay Is that clear I haven't missed anything okay so this one is called q to the power 4 this one is called q cubed v and there are four of them. This term is called q squared v squared and uh, there are, how many of them are there? How many terms of this type I can write down? Four, very good. And then this one. 2, q squared v squared times 2 plus 4 q v cubed plus uh, q4. That is it. Sorry, q4 we already wrote. It is q v4. Ah, the chair. Now, okay. Bottle also. <laughs> okay. Now, okay. 
Yeah. Okay, so my time is kind of up. Uh, it's not fully up. I have 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I think um, we can somehow remove this uh, divided by Q. And okay. Maybe we can say that if uh, we take a limit hmm. that uh, Q is, uh, goes to zero, yeah. and then uh, we come up to a situation that uh, there is only a, a cluster, but uh, it's not uh, a cluster. Um, we cannot distinguish between that cluster hmm. and whole of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is uh, so. If you, uh, the way I have described this problem, everything is working for finite graphs, and it is well defined and well behaved. What you are describing will only work in the thermodynamic large size limit or some such thing, and I don't want to invoke that now. I am describing finite systems. You know, there is a four by four sand pile or some such thing. I don't want to take the thermodynamic limit now. Most of the formulas or all the formulas are working for finite sizes. And I don't take the thermodynamic limit first. Thermodynamic limit should be taken last. Yes, uh, uh, I mean that uh, we cannot uh, cut the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the perimeter of the cluster. So no, so I'm saying to whatever question you are asking, answer it for this graph, simple graph. Then what is the statement you will make? Not much. No, no, no. If the question answer disappears, because the question disappears. For finite graphs, there are questions you can ask. So actually, that comment is not trivial. Let me state it now. Suppose you have the sand pile model. You can define it on finite graphs. We, that's what we have done. And then you take the limit of large sizes. But people can do it the other way. They say, let us define an infinite lattice, and then there is a sand pile, there is a height at each side, and then can I define a steady state of the pile? And it becomes a very uh, tricky problem. And it's actually non-trivial, non-easy, not infinite volume limit, does it exist? I can go into some head spin because um, because the, sometimes the avalanche is last forever or some such thing. And all those problems are not there if you work with finite systems. So I want to get rid of all those problems and not even ask the question. Even the question of what happens in the infinite limit should be asked only after you have worked out the finite size cases, not first. Okay? Yes. Function of the, um, so, state part model. If you, the Hamiltonian hmm. somehow we can interpret it as an Ising type. So if you put the Z Q V and put Q equal to two, it gives you the exact partition function for all finite graphs and in the thermodynamic limit. Just put Q equal to two. The V is called the high temperature expansion parameter ten hyperbolic beta J. And so this gives you the partition function of the Ising model exactly. If you put Q equal to 2, it gives you the exact partition function of the Ising model. Yes, uh, I mean uh, other values of Q, but uh, an Ising type interpretation. You know, Ising type means what? Uh, we can say that the summation on sigma i, hmm? sigma j, but that's what we did, no? We started with Q states per site and we gave an Ising-like interpretation to begin with. But then I, when I have Q equal to 0.1, it's not possible to define the model in terms of states per site. Okay? Then I have to define uh, it through this summation, this one. Uh, uh, this one. It's a well-defined summation. It gives you configurations and weights over configurations. But the weights are non-local weights, and they are not defined in terms of spins, but in terms of clusters. OK? Uh, the graphs you draw at the bottom of the board yes. uh, 
No, so I actually, this one is of course with no edges, this one is with one edge, but I wrote it like this, but the bracket shows all graphs of this type, which says that four, you add up all the four terms. So I wrote a weight four here. They are distinguishable, so but I have been lazy and I wrote only one. Okay, the brackets are supposed to indicate whatever else I didn't, I was just lazy. I should have written four terms, I didn't write. Sorry, say it again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can put, so the, instead of V, you can write V1 plus V2 plus V3 plus V4. This 4V will become V1 plus V2 plus V3 plus V4 if I have different edges. Yes. So if you put the number uh, besides each node, hmm. 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah. you have connection between 1 and 2, yeah. 2 and 3, 3 and 4, and 4 and 1. This is yeah. 4. Oh, but those are terms in the Hamiltonian. I didn't have an edge between them. Okay. Okay, are there any other questions? No, so this is very nice. I believe, um, I hope, that you are actually following whatever is being done. It is being done at a somewhat slow pace. But I felt that it is better to ensure that you understand what is being done and appreciate that it is moderately straightforward and not get the idea that yeah, 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 there is some problem which can be solved, but you know, I will read it up next time. I don't have to understand it now. I am sort of hoping that you will actually just read them once, read the notes or whatever once more, you will understand everything, it is not so big deal, okay. And uh, so then even if we don't cover everything, it is quite okay, I am not too unhappy. Okay, some details are left for the um, people who enjoy the subject more, right? So reading up original Kirchhoff's papers, it's a very nice literary exercise. You know, you may actually enjoy, people read novels in addition to reading physics, right? So read Kirchhoff's paper as a novel not as a um, sort of physics exercise, it's very educative, okay? Okay, so we stop here now.